Hi, everyone. Morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you're at. Seems like we have lots of us all across the planet, so that's awesome. Um, I'm delighted to be here. My name is Micah McLaughlin, and like some of you in chat, I found life itself not very long ago just through my own interest in intentional living, community building, um, systems change. So uh, it feels like we're all in good company. My, uh, you know, given this topic, I'll say that starting when I was a teenager, I was obsessed with intentional communities, which was pretty uncommon at the time. It was, you know, in the 90s and the only kind of intentional community that anybody really knew about was the communes in the 60s and 70s. But for whatever reason, I got obsessed with intentional communities. So my friends uh, got very sick of hearing about them. Um, but here we are, you know, 20, 25 years later, and I feel like I have watched something quite almost esoteric or um, very outside of the norm become a really commonplace conversation around so many people feeling um you know, the call to live in a more community setting lifestyle. So um, I wanted to come in today and talk about a community project that we started when I was 22 and what we did that was actually really beneficial. And so I imagine that many of you have also had your experiences. So I wanna make sure that we have lots of time to kind of open up the conversation here and talk about um, what have you found as best practices. So um, I'm going to intend to have a couple moments while I'm talking that you might wanna um, answer a question so that you're kind of journaling a little bit along the way. You don't have to journal if you don't want to, but that can sort of set us up for a, a robust discussion. Shall I just dive in, Lauren? Yeah, of course. Yeah, feel free to, to carry on as much as you want. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so by way of introduction, um, when I was in my late teens, I came across Ken Wilber's work. So I'm curious in chat how many of you have been impacted by Ken's work. Again, at that time, he was very well known in his world. Um, but it was still kind of, you know, the esoteric part of the bookstore. And it was, you know, we were kind of misfits to be drawn to Ken in the 90s. Uh, and he put out a call for young people to come to Boulder, Colorado and start helping him build um, iLife at the time. And so we um we got the call and so a couple of my friends and I moved to to Colorado and this was in 2003 and so there was sort of a community building in Boulder and that's in the US for any of you who don't know um and so a group of us started uh we we rented a house together and so that house started with eight people and we were all in our uh, 20s. I was the youngest at 22. And that community house ended up going on for 11 years. And over 50 people lived inside of the house. And so part of what I'm sharing today is that these two things that we did that I think made the whole community project really have a lot of longevity. Um, but before I go into those two things, I wanted to weave a little bit with some things that Lauren and the and life itself have been doing around this values conversation. Um, so I want to kind of set some context for what our values were in that community. But Lauren, do you want to say anything about that? I know you put a call out for this. Yeah, yeah, no, great. Thank you. Yeah. So um, very quickly, in line with World Values Day, which is on the 18th or 19th of October, forgotten off the top of my head now um we are 
instigating or helping people instigate conversations within their community around values and what we're doing is we're sharing those values in the whatsapp chat and just um we also have a a blog post where we're sort of offering guidance on how to have conversations around values whether that's with friends family or wider community and then what we're also running is we're running a call where we can all come together and we can all have a life itself values based conversation and we can see how those discussions have been going and kind of just really see where conversations around values um can take us so that's Mm -hmm. that's, i've sent the link in the chat for anyone that's interested and hasn't registered yet awesome you know, as I've been thinking about the values conversation and, you know, this call that we're having right now, I've been noticing that there was probably something about this community house that ended up working quite well that is a little bit in the invisible space, right? Sometimes the things that are working are invisible because they're not problems, right? And I think that was true in this community house to some degree, because we did have a lot of shared values coming in. Uh, And I think with a community project, there's a little bit of a paradox where we need shared values, but if they're too shared, there's not quite enough diversity to have some um, kind of polarity and um, energy. So I think it's a delicate uh, balance. So, the way it's been occurring me to think about the values in this community that started is almost like concentric circles. So we had a very large circle where in our case, we were at a similar stage of life. So that was a shared um, piece that I think helped the house work well. I don't think that's necessary, but it happened to be the case in this community where we were all, <clears throat> in our, so we were in a similar stage of life. Um, and then But then we had um, a couple of smaller concentric circles where not everybody was the same. And in our case, um, there was a big center of gravity around contemplative practice, meditation, the Eastern wisdom traditions. So that was a real anchor in the community that everybody was coming in on that basis with that value. But I wanted to share the um i wanted to share from the article from the link that you sent out lauren about the um values conversation which i thought was really awesome this model looking at these various kind of groupings of values so before i share more i'm I want to invite all of you as a bit of interaction or your own personal process to feel into which of these values are the most important to you in community or in your life. Um, What are the things that you want to cohere around? And maybe you might notice, you know, one, two, or three. And also the ones that you're actually resistant to, like that's also really, really valuable information. So I'll just give you like 30 seconds. Happy to hear anything in chat that you're noticing or drawn or repulsed by. I found it interesting that in this community project, we really were up here in these three, which are next to each other. I don't know the model well enough to know if the um, placement has uh, meaning in it, but we were very... um, we had deep spiritual practices, basically. So at this at this intersection of universalism and benevolence, that ended up having some of this conformity because there was a real value around the discipline of spiritual practice that was part of the anchor in the house. Um, but we were also fairly self-directed in our community structure. So some communities, you know, you do a lot of cooking together, you do a lot of cleaning together, you do a lot of financial um, collaboration. We were less in that direction. We were more self-directed as a as a house structure. Everybody was doing their own thing. But then in terms of that balance between shared values and also differences, we had six of the eight working with Ken Wilbur. So that was a big contingent, 
that really had a lot of coherence in it. But then we had two that weren't, right? And then we had, I think four of those people were going to Naropa University. And so that had its own kind of coherence in it, but four weren't, right? Um, so that I think was an invisible part of what helped the community work. <laughs> And then um, I wanna shift into talking about the two things that we did that I think were the biggest factors besides perhaps shared values that made the community last so long. Um, but to start that, I just wanna ask you all a question of like, where do you think the vulnerability points are in a community housing or living project? Like, what do you think the biggest places of issue can come up? Because one of the things that we did is we looked at where those vulnerability levers were and asked ourselves hard questions about those places and came up with something that really supported the house in that way. So I'm curious out there in chat or um, you know, if you wanna reflect on it yourself, what do you see as the big places of vulnerability in a community living situation working or not? Also, just to say, people can unmute and just chime in as loud if they if they want. That's awesome. I love that. One person says, uh, "I would guess the biggest issues are around power." Mm -hmm. I think that's great, Michael. Yeah, Simon, you want to. Yeah, I was going to say, from my own experience at Lancaster Care Housing, the thing that surprised me, I mean, power is, is, is an obvious one, but the thing that really surprised me was um, the question of kind of uh, psychological security. That's mm -hmm. not quite represented here, but um, it's sort of close to security, but it's, and it's kind of related to a sense of belonging. But that is a huge one, huge, yeah. mo much more than I thought it would be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and so you're saying psychological psychological security as a sense of belonging and connection within the group. Uh, yeah, in the sense that um, you know, when people don't uh, have the set, when people when people's values split, or when people are not aligned enough, uh, you get a sense. Uh, I've experienced a sense of people being actually uh, feeling uh afraid being vul too vulnerable you know not not just vulnerable but actually um antagonistic and you know and sort of uh, re rejecting of, of others and feeling attacked uh and that's is a real huge problem in my experience totally totally i think you're nailing it and whenever we feel threatened we kind of like the worst comes out right like um, so when we feel threatened of not belonging, it's a very dicey, dicey time. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because there's kind of this archetype of the black sheep, right? Or the misfit. But interestingly enough, when you bring people together based on shared values, <laughs> there's often still one or two people that end up expressing the black sheep role. Even if the shared values themselves are like a bunch of black sheep coming together, somehow over time, that group dynamic reveals the black sheep role. Does that make sense? Um, it makes see. so much sense. That's so interesting. Such an interesting reflection. Mm hmm. Right. Totally. Is it useful for me to read out some of the things in the chat for you, Micah? That'd be great. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. So we've had a few other people say priorit prioritization or orientation of self versus others, power and security, people taking sufficient responsibility differences in relating, emotional maturity, um, and interest in whether tradition can be reimagined as less hierarchical. Um, and this person's nervous of power and money, but is often the symptom, but not the real issue, which is differing needs for recognition or support, the group shadow. Um, and yeah, and then someone else has also said in relation to the black sheet, there's also always the class clown as well. Mm -hmm. This is so good. 
This is so good. Everyone's just really nailing it in terms of it's complex, you know, it's really complex and there's a lot that can come up. Um, I will say that one of the things that we did not expect to be such a huge point of vulnerability was um, dishes. <laughs> dishes were an endless ongoing challenge. Like the most arguments and friction in the house happened around what was going on in the kitchen sink. And so that is sort of a, an expression of these larger kind of self versus other taking responsibility, whether you do more of your share or less of your share, et cetera. Um, but man, in community living, having a system around dishes, I actually think is one of the most important things for a community to work um, because it's just so all day long, every single day is a point of contention. Those are not two of the things I'm going to share, but it's an aside. Um, and what ended up happening in the dishes is it became an expression of, I think, a lot of the things that you're all talking about, right? So when there was conflict, what level of emotional maturity did someone have when they were having a trigger around the dishes? Um, or... Uh, you know, who was more hierarchical and who was more like collaborative, like all of those things came into play at the kitchen sink. <laughs> um, group shadow and individual shadow, like who was not doing a dishes, but didn't know they weren't doing their dishes, like literally just didn't know <laughs> because they had a blind spot. Um, so anyway, very interesting. So what we... What we identified when we started the house, so first of all, what we did is we we had big conversations around what were the places of most vulnerability. And we tried to create a structure from the outset that was designing for those places of vulnerability. So what I'm going to share may or may not be relevant to you, but what I think is relevant is for a community to look at what the vulnerability points are and really try to create win-win agreements ahead of time based on them. So that's um, the umbrella that I think made the house work so well. And so we, um, we deeply acknowledged two that I'm going to talk about today. And the first one was money. You know, it's it's not the romantic side of things, but um, it wasn't part of the big vision or mission, but we really saw the financial situation as so vulnerable because nobody in the house could be left holding the bag financially of someone not paying the rent. Like we were in our 20s, none of us made very much money. And it was like, it was just black or white. We cannot have that happen. So. Um, in our situation, we uh, each room was very different. So each room had its own kind of monthly price tag that was a spectrum of prices. And um, and so this and then the second thing we recognized is that it was the moving in and out moment that was rife for issues to come up, including the financial one. If someone left, and the rest of the house was left holding the bag on their rent. That was the intersection of those two pieces. And then additionally, the moving in and out process was also where we, you can still hear me. The moving in and out process was also where we saw one of the biggest interpersonal vulnerabilities because depending on who came in and whether the, the house wanted them or you know what those interpersonal dynamics were, um, we sensed was um, really rife with potential problems. So here's what we did at the intersection of those two things. Um, we made it an agreement. So there were eight people that started the house, but then this was the structure for moving forward that worked so well. Uh, for someone to come into the house, or excuse me, for someone to leave, life changed, they want to move, they want to shift. Um, 
they were a hundred percent responsible for paying their rent until they had done all the work to go out into the world and advertise their room for rent, describe the community, what was happening there, who was there, who, who would be a good fit, find candidates for their room that were interested vet those candidates personally, knowing who the house was and what the ho- what, who would work pr- likely well with the house, vet that all those candidates financially, and then only propose to the house those who they thought were a really good fit for the house. And then the house, and they also had to organize the house meetings to meet the candidates. Does this make sense the way I'm saying it? So the person, like all the responsibility was essentially on the person leaving to bring the house candidates. And then the house, the agreement was that the house needed to reach a unanimous agreement for someone to be accepted to move in. And that was hard. You know, sometimes it worked really simply and the first candidate was like a all green lights and it was really easy. There were other times where we had hours and hours of discussion and, you know, differences and um, sometimes having to meet candidate after candidate and have go through these hours of discussion before, you know, four or five candidates later, we all could reach a unanimous decision. And the person leaving was responsible for continuing to bring good candidates to the house um, until that unanimous decision was made. But there was a really great incentive structure around this because the person leaving, um, they didn't wanna be in this process looking for candidates forever. So it was in their interest to make sure that they were only bringing candidates that they really thought the house was gonna like. And so what ended up happening is that when somebody was unanimously agreed upon to come, that was the moment where that money for their room was in the bank. Then the person leaving was released from their financial responsibility and only then. And so the agreement to move into this house was that if you wanted to leave and it took you six months or a year for the house to agree to one of the candidates unanimously, you were on the hook financially until that happened. So I'm going to talk about some details of how this ended up playing out, but I just want to pause here and see if there's anything that you're noticing or you want to share, any thoughts or comments. Yes, James, it was like an interview process. That's exactly right. If anyone has any any thoughts or comments, you're welcome to unmute and just uh, just share accordingly. I guess I'd I'd have just the main question of if you ever had to, I think you said you were going to already uh, tell us an actual concrete story. So maybe you're getting to this. But I'm curious whether it has to actually be enforced because I can imagine a lot of situations where you have to leave for emergency purposes or you're or maybe I'm just thinking post pandemic things that happen that people were moving around more than they might have expected and just cannot find it. Was it ever an issue? <clears throat> It's so interesting, Isabella, because just remembering context, like none of us had very much money, (laughs) like nobody had extra, right? Um, So it was a really big deal to be on the hook for the rent if you had to leave in an emergency, but it was essentially equally a big deal if you got left holding the bag, right? Um, And so the community house went on for 11 years with over 50 people there. I was there for the better part of the first seven And, um, we only like in, during my time living there, I'm only aware of one time that someone didn't uphold this agreement. So actually, you know, 
the agreement that you were making to enter the house was that if you had an emergency and had to leave, that was fine, but you were still going to pay rent until you found a candidate for the house to approve. And we made it very clear that like, if you don't like this agreement, that's okay, but then this is not a fit for you. And so for the most part, everybody really had integrity around that. I but I think- The main thing that you, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think the main thing you just pointed out was that um, you realized that everybody else was going to be holding the bag. <clears throat> it's not a coercive thing only. It's about responsibility or care for the other people. And of course, you've been living with them. So I think that that makes a lot of sense. Yes, yes. And then also, it wasn't like we muddled through this. We laid this anchor from the initial moment that the house started. So anybody that came in was coming in on the basis of congruence with this agreement. That doesn't mean they couldn't be out of integrity with the agreement that they made, but it was just the way that we, we saw this as a vulnerable transition moment. And then we brought people in who could agree to transitioning the way we just we de determined or we you know laid out, and most people did. It was like it, like we in some ways we vetted their integrity on that the basis of that agreement. Melanie says it seems like a high standard to me in a positive way, which probably made everyone feel that they take it mutually seriously. Yeah, that's right. That's right. There was a really high standard and there was like a demand, which is partly how we vetted people who didn't appreciate that. They didn't even resonate with the house to begin with. And how long roughly did the process take, would you say, if somebody was exiting and trying to find an aligned new person? What was the kind of yeah. like timelines for that? We were in Boulder, Colorado, and because we were 20-somethings, and then as the house aged, it became more 20s and 30s. And, you know, there were people there in their 40s eventually, too. Um, but it was a college town. So, you know, the price was pretty good because it was a shared house with eight bedrooms, um, and I mean, it's so funny now to think about, but like, I think the most expensive room in the house was like 480 a month, $480 a month. Um, but, uh, it generally went pretty fast because we had a strong rental market in our community. And it ultimately was really desire. Like the, the house itself was also really desirable for the culture of our town as well. Like people moved to Boulder typically with a lot of shared values. So, and, and desire for, you know, community living on the basis of these values. So again, those are one of those invisible things that made it work that, you know, you don't, you kind of take for granted. Um, but the local rental market is really going to affect, you know, and the likelihood of other people with the shared values with your community in the area is going to affect how long that interview process might have taken. And generally, it was fairly quick. I think we probably most often interviewed two and maybe three candidates before we found somebody. Right. Average. Yeah, so that means it was one. Um, I've got a question. It's really interesting because I'm thinking back to houses uh, sort of co it wasn't really co-living. It was almost in Berkeley, um, about this in also my twenties, where th this would have helped a lot. But we had some good experiences too. But my question is whether you've ever, whether the house ever discussed collectively chipping in to help someone who is struggling with the finances of that agreement, because this was a situation I had once where that's effectively what I did, but the rest of the house didn't want to do that but that was if yeah I just like that could be a kind of a an extra possibility that would help people but I guess you wouldn't want to say that up front maybe it's too tricky I don't know well there's trade-offs right <laughs> um and I don't remember being there personally in that situation. And granted, my memory is not that great from this long ago, so I might not remember at all. But um, I do think that there was something like that, hap that happened when I wasn't living there. 
Um, but it's a beautiful thing, right? And I think the point that I really want to bring across is that the agreements that we make about the community living, that as much as we can make them on the front end, the better it all plays out, mm -hmm. right? Um, so like, for example, and this is just a hypothetical Bronwyn, but like, if the house agreed, like if somebody's struggling financially, we as a house are going to do our best to support them as our, you know, human family in this context. And that person is going to be in charge of all the bathroom cleaning while that's occurring. Right. Like, right. <laughs> That gets like set up on the front end as a win-win situation in a in a tough place, and then yeah, it just yeah. and it and it's about the mutual integrity again. Yep, yep, exactly. Anyone else for now, or I'll I'll share I'll share an example of where things went sideways, even inside of this agreement. Next, but yeah, Simon, I, I've got a question actually, which is a great interest to me at the moment. But um, did you ever make explicit the kind of qualities that you were looking for in new house, uh, new community members, or was it just a case of like you know? by feel you know like it's like like you described the process somebody leaves they they look for people that feel right and then the community has a feel as to whether they feel right or not was there ever was was there anything that you ever made explicit rather than just in just intuitive feeling we made it very explicit actually um ah. was, i was pretty i was so young then i was 22 um so, you know, I ended up becoming very sophisticated in marketing in my business life. But at that time, I didn't technically have a lot of marketing skills, but I did have kind of a natural, um, I had a little bit of a natural talent for writing marketing copy. So we had a very, very long, um, like advertisement post you know, that we, that we used. I mean, it was before social media, so it wasn't a post in social media, but the way we invited people, you know, the way we advertised an open room, it was long. Like we definitely made explicit everything that we could think of, um, both in terms of values, who we were, how we did cleaning, how we did food, what the rents were, like what the agreements were. So all of that was laid out. Would you still have a copy of that anywhere, which I could see? <laughs> that would be yeah, really that's interesting. A great, that's a great question. <laughs> I would have to look at a pretty old hard drive to see if I could find it, but I will, I will, I will look. Yeah. I'll 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 leave, I'll leave my email in the in the chat here. <laughs> well, if if Micah's happy, if she can send it to me, I can put it in the updated blog post, so then it will be available for everyone to to view it. Great, yeah, yeah that'd be great. And and sorry, I, I'm I'm suddenly feeling very very tired. I'm going to drop off in a minute, but just carry on. <laughs> and we've got so Melanie, who's um also got her hand up as well to ask a question. Um. I wonder what would you say um, made your co-living situation different from just living in a shed that like how was it a conscious co-living community and not just a bunch of young people living together? Um, That's a great question. Yeah. That's a great question. In some ways, nothing because we literally just found a, ha a very large house and we had eight roommates, like there were eight roommates in it. So in some ways it was just a roommate situation. Um, and I think that was, it was directionally true what you're saying that it was like a roommate situation because of how many things that we didn't collaborate in like we didn't do shared meals or we didn't do shared grocery shopping or we didn't grow our own food right mm. um we weren't we didn't have a shared business or financial life so in that way it was a lot like roommates 
Um, I think what made it like more of a conscious community living situation is because we were drawing people in on the basis of shared values that were pretty contrary to the mainstream U.S. culture of our time. Mm. And so that goes back to, you know, that initial advertisement where we laid out our shared values in detail and drew people in on that basis. And so that was the reason that you were living in that house together. And that's what made it, um, it made it feel quite communal. Mm. Do you remember which values you shared in your advertisement? Yeah, I mean, I think that in many ways, like the, the most important shared value was a contemplative spiritual practice. Mm. Like you, like you were in this house because you were on a spiritual path. You cared about um, personal development. You were interested in cultural change. Um, so that was the center of gravity. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't any particular tradition. Like there was definitely a weight toward um, the Eastern wisdom traditions, but there's lots of Eastern wisdom traditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, and Isabella has also got a question as well. Yeah, it's actually following up, I guess, with Melanie's question, which is, um, were there things, so you didn't eat together, you didn't do, you know, these kinds of things that you often hear, um, co-living spaces or, or experiences um, do so it was were there contemplative uh practices that you did together was there anything sort of explicitly we're doing this together apart from living under the same roof with these which it, it's not to say anything I, I love the idea that there was also so much individuality and, and independence but I'm just curious whether there was some kind of um desire for shared experience when whilst you're living together yeah, totally. Yeah, we did. I mean, and to make it clear, we ate together a lot. We just didn't have our formal requirement that you were going to cook this many times a week or share groceries in this way. Um, as an aside, that was another big vulnerability that we didn't realize was that with eight people living in a house, your fridge space was about this big. <laughs> Even with two fridges. Um, but yeah, so we did eat together and then we had a meditation room that was like just an open room. And so there, you know, it kind of flowed in and out where sometimes we would have a much bigger anchor happening. Um, and I think that's something to remember too, in communal living is that either you have rules that require people to do something, um, or, inside of a horizontal structure, you still need people to lead a group dynamic and like anchor something. So like in phases where somebody led holding the meditation practice every morning, then the community could cohere around it. Um, and I think it's really useful to remember those two pieces. It's like you can either bring coherence through rule-based agreements from the beginning, or there's like there's like a, a a way that somebody needs to lead to bring the group into coherence around something. I think ideally you have some of both, but as you're feeling into maybe your desire for community living feeling into which of those poles or which where on that spectrum you are attracted is really valuable to know about yourself to find the right fit or to create the right fit more rules for coherence or less coherence unless somebody leads or somewhere in the middle yeah I'm my <laughs> hi um Maybe this says something about me, this question, but I, I wonder when the rules and agreements kind of become um, an obstacle to living with a bunch of people peacefully. I'm wondering, like, you know, where that sweet spot is between, you know, just enough rules to to um, get along without it becoming 
cumbersome and feeling like you're living in an HOA. That's right. That's right. And for sure, most people have kind of a constitution where they like rules and structure more, or they like rules and structure less. You know, there's like a, a spectrum and most individuals will sit somewhere there. And then similarly, like with the black sheep discussion we had earlier, anytime you bring a group of people together, <laughs> um, the group will have like kind of a center of gravity. And then it shows the outliers to that center of gravity. Right. So like for you, Michael, let's say you happen to like rules a little bit less because it would feel kind of tyrannical or uh, oppressive in your system over time. But you could easily end up in a group of people who didn't who who felt similarly. And then you might emerge as the outlier where you actually liked rules a little bit more than the center of gravity of that group. So what I'm pointing to is that like most of us will have a constitution and then the group itself will actually like reveal itself in the group dynamic. Like the individuals end up revealing themselves kind of in a different way depending on the group dynamic. Am I saying that in a way that makes sense? Like maybe I'm misunderstanding, but does the black sheep kind of help the group identify where it stands? So let's say you got a group of eight people who are by definition black sheep. And part of why they're black sheep is they tend to not like rules. And so they create a community culture that has less rules so that it doesn't have that HOA feel. And then within the group of eight people who are black sheep, in the larger culture and who don't like rules in compared to the larger culture, you will have a couple individuals find out inside of that group that they like rules more than the group does and start to see the value for the rules and start to be the voice for the rules. And that is part of what makes community living a really dynamic thing is that because you bring people together often on a shared basis of values, but then inside of the experience, you will you will have people emerge that are contrary to it. So even though you think you're a group of one type of people, balance ends up emerging through the black. Well, and outliers, outliers yeah. emerge. The outliers will tend to always emerge, no matter how much shared values you have. Yeah. Does that, um, that wasn't your question, Michael, your question was, you know, how do you do it in a way that is less like an HOA? And ultimately the project I'm describing, the house I'm describing was in that direction. We did not have a lot of rules and we did not have a lot of things that were required. Um, so in that spectrum, we were much more on the kind of agentic roommate side of the spectrum. This is great. This is so interesting. Thank you, Micah. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left. So I'm obviously happy to continue the conversation, hear people's thoughts, reflections. But I really feel like it's so interesting when we consider the group dynamics and how actually we adapt to fit into often certain roles and certain types. And I guess that is where a lot of the, I suppose the shadow work in essence can often be brought out when you're in that group dynamic, which is often what you've initially been drawn to because you are not feeling aligned with the kind of wider cultural aspects. And then you're kind of confronted with a lot of underlying layers that maybe weren't able to, to come out because you were feeling that you were embodying something different when you were in the mainstream so mm -hmm. I think it's so so I feel like we could oh, you know talk about this for a long time but does anybody else have any other questions reflections thoughts they'd like to share on this Isabella your hand is up yeah yeah, for it. yeah I was just it's so interesting this group dynamic because because it's 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 all about systems thinking at this level the system itself requires 
a certain amount of energy, a certain movement and equilibrium to be upheld. And so this is what I was saying that there's the black sheep can often change, but there's almost always a rebel that's required to push on a healthy system so that people continue to um, communicate openly, to be challenged and to figure out how to deal with conflict and so on. So the actual, there's a certain level at the system level that the members don't actually matter in, ter in terms of their identity, but that you almost always need a leader sometimes that emerges in certain context. The, the example I have was also with eight people that um, meet communally for um, a week to three weeks, depending on it. And in that context, I never consider myself a leader, except that these people are absolutely against doing anything unless there's at least a little bit of a like ringing bell somewhere. And so somehow I emerged as, does anyone want to do this? And it's absolutely interesting that it feels like it's the system that's demanding it, not the individuals at all. And not exactly. even me. I just kind of show up because no one else will. And other people do other things, right? In the same way. I just find it all very interesting at that level of analysis. Yeah. Super interesting. There's a, uh, I haven't looked at it in a long time and I don't know if I'm getting the whole name right, but it's called matrix and it's a group. It's like a group dynamics model that is really valuable at looking at like how these roles emerge inside of any group and how people end up kind of becoming a role for the whole group, whether they, and it's not even that they wanted to or intended to, it just like how it kind of happens. So Isabella, the matrix group dynamic might be something fun for you to look at. Yeah, Pascal. Um, I, I had the desire since uh, probably like seven, eight years to live in community, but I've always been in uh, big cities and I've always been like, okay, at some point, I'll move into nature and kind of find community there. But uh, this call, uh, and actually the thing that you said about, like, um, the the one of the rules around um, um, that you always have a stable number of people in the house that are paying, mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. inspired me to be like, Oh wait, actually, that reduces the risk so much that I could actually do this in Paris, uh, where I am right now. And so, <laughs> I'm wondering if you have any tips for anyone that would like to set out on this journey. I mean, I'm going to read uh, the Life Itself Conscious Co Living blog, but uh, I'd be curious if you have any other pointers. Yeah, yeah. So a couple things like. One of those invisible things that I think helped make the house happen was that there were three people who decided to find a, a place to rent with many bedrooms. So again, there was like an ink, like there were three people that anchored something. And it wasn't any one person alone, but it was enough of a group. And it wasn't too many people either, because then you have so many cooks in the kitchen right out of the out of the gate. So three people anchored it, three people found the house, three people signed the lease, right? And then drew the other five in to make the financials work. So that might be something um, that you could use as a model of like, figure out who your best friend is or your two best friends and be like, this is what, you know, or two people that you really like and know you want to live with so that you can create a coherence of what your vision is, what the financials are, what kind of thing you're looking for, do the work of finding it and then draw people in on that coherent basis. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just, I'd love to just add one practice that I did in, in this Berkeley house, which would built on exactly what you've just said, Micah. So it was three people we found, it wasn't huge, but, um, we drew in extra people on that basis. And the the one rule, we didn't do that finance living out rule that you said, although I think that would have helped down the line. Um, but what we did coming in is we said, we have a shared rule and you have to agree to this if you move in, that you have to cook a meal for the house. I think there were seven of us um, once a week. Yeah. So and, and we have a shared food budget, but you don't have to... Um, well, leave aside the money. The point was that you had to, you had to 
produce this meal for everybody and nobody had to come, but right. just once a week. And it just meant that most of the time you didn't have to cook. It was fantastic. You got these unbelievable meals and it, it created a kind of a shared. It, one person moved in and was really nervous about this because he said he couldn't cook and we taught him to cook like starting really, really basic meals. And he was very empowered by that. And, and that was just, I mean, it's, it sounds like it's quite a high standard of sharing things. And I was kind of taken aback by how little people shared living in America together because it seemed quite normal to me, but because um, I hadn't come from, from there. But anyway, that was just a really good practice. That's so cool, Bronwyn. And just to zoom out for a moment, like circling back with Michael, I know we're coming up on time, but like that is such an amazing example of where there was a requirement. Like it was a rule. This is what you're agreeing to. You cook once a week for the whole house. And yet at the same time, there was tons of agency in the way that you designed it. You didn't have to do it at a certain time. You got to pick whatever meal you wanted. They could like it or not like it or whatever, right? Um, and so I love it as what you said as an example of a rule that has a lot of agency in it. That's a kind of in that sweet spot. Mm. And at the same time, it creates like a shared ritual around food, which, mm. and I, I like the fact that you don't need to attend. Like you're basically, there's always food. Yes. You're always yes. a meal <laughs> for you if you eat it or not. Um, yeah. So it's, uh, it's beautiful. Yeah. I think I'll just say in conclusion, you know, hopefully in about 30 seconds, is just that um, in terms of a lot of things that were mentioned in chat around the vulnerabilities, like when it comes to our animal nervous system, when we're afraid financially or interpersonally, our human nervous system response to those two threats is really huge. It's like existential kind of threat response. So whatever community design that you might come up with, I do, you know, my offering is to really understand the financial and the interpersonal vulnerability points, because that's where you can just get rid of a whole bunch of issues. Like we never really had the experience of everybody getting freaked out financially and attacking each other because they were scared. And starting to point fingers, it just never happened because we didn't have that threat come up in the in the system. That's wonderful. Yeah, I think that's such a a beautiful and valid point to to draw a conclusion on this uh, conversation. On, um, I I feel like I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of everyone, but um, I feel from my personal reflections, this has been a really wonderful, really insightful. And really nice to have so much engagement with the community and people asking questions and really being involved. So it's really felt like a, a true community call. So thank you so much. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to offer a final 20 second sentence or anything before we end this call. Um, you're more than welcome to. Um, I'm just scanning things. Yeah, I'm just okay. uh, just feeling feeling really grateful because it really simplifies the thought and I didn't come up I, I didn't come into this call thinking that oh wait actually I can do that um, <laughs> it felt always like a kind of like a difficult thing but it's actually like co it's co-living as you said like it's roommates um, so it's um, yeah it's beautiful thank you so cool, Pascal. I want to know if you start a community house in Paris because I might want to apply. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> I, can I ask just a really quick question, Micah? If if you're now living in a communal context or not, I'm just wondering if you got totally turned off by it. It was a stage in your life, and now you're like independent and alone, and never ever going to do it again. Oh, that's so great. Um, funnily enough, I have not been living in a community for a long time. Um, my business, I just got back from Costa Rica where my business partner just bought property in, um, a community, a community starting there. So I was just there looking to see if maybe I wanted to build a house on, on that, in that community. Um, but I ended up building my whole career around community. Um, so I don't, I haven't been living in community, mm -hmm. but 
I continued on a very communal dharmic path. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah. One, one last thing that's just an aside is that um, my business partner and I have done something really unique, I think, where we're business partners in a business but we have developed our company as like financial life partners in the entire team. So our whole team perceives ourselves as a financial ecosystem where we make, we don't just run a company together. We think about investment decisions. We think about mutual, mutual investments. We, we basically run our financial life communally. That's a whole nother topic, but yeah, a lot of weight about it somewhere. I should write about it. I should write about it. Mm -hmm. And I think we are, we are going to consider maybe inviting Micah back to do a bit more of a a business related masterclass, but I can't offer too much on that at the moment because Micah and I haven't actually had the conversation yet. So uh, (laughs) that's to be revealed. Um, Okay, so I will say a final thank you again, Micah. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I can tell that everyone else has really, really enjoyed it. And I look forward to when people are able to to catch up on this. The recording will be up probably at some point next week. Um, And until then, thank you all so much for attending and take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you all so much.